Hi everyone, here's the book Amis once again and today I'm reviewing To Have and Have Not by Ernst Hemingway, a snapshot of America at the height of the Great Depression and a book that's as relevant today as it was when it was published for how it captures the consequences of great economical disaster on the lives of common people and certain disconnects within society that are at the heart of this crisis and that cannot help but sustain them. This video, by the way, is sponsored by Skillshare, an online community of creatives and passionate fans of all sorts of pursuits, from illustration to gardening to cooking and even more. I'll talk about it more at the end of the video, but you should know that there's a link in the description box that will give the first thousand people to click on it a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. To Have and Have Not is set between Cuba and the Florida Keys, and Key West in particular, a town that Hemingway knew very well. Uh, he would spend um, long portions of the year at a certain point in his life in Key West. Once when he was there he punched Wallace Stevens who was talking trash about him. What a twat! Wallace Stevens was significantly older than him. The novel follows Captain Harry Morgan, a man with a boat whose boat is his livelihood. He takes tourists out uh, in the open sea to fish. He does a bit of smuggling until certain events, certain, uh, well, consequences of his dangerous lifestyle crossing into Cuba and back to the US doom him to lose an arm and lead him on a path that will take him down a very dark uh, route. Uh, the novel follows Her Henry uh, for its first half, but especially toward the end, it expands and takes in the whole community of Key West. Uh, some of Harry's uh, line... Uh, lifelong friends, who some of whom are doing relatively okay in the course of the depression. Fred, the, the, um, the barman at the local bar, is doing especially well because in times of uh, such great poverty, one thing you can rely on is that people will always want to get wasted. Other people, like Harry's friend Albert, are not doing as well. They all have a family to maintain and to look after, and they can't really find work of any kind, and many of them, too, will get involved in the organized crime and the underworld that in general thrives within these conditions. Because Key West was an important tourist spot at the time, the novel is also able to follow the lives of a few tourists who are in Key West for the winter. A writer and his wife in particular become uh, particularly central to the later developments of the plot. And the great disconnect between these wealthy tourists who come down to Florida to spend the cold season in a, in a warmer spot, and the people who live there, who have grown up here, who struggle on a day-to-day, -day, on a weekly basis, to put food on their tables. The disconnect between these two different types of life is at the heart of the book, and the title captures it most significantly. A few points, a few reflections scattered in the book drive this point home in a very strong, in a very uh, impactful manner. Toward the end, once the novel has left Harry behind a little bit, has exploded in a way to follow so many different minds that orbit around this town, around Key West. We find, for instance, a young uh, trust fund uh, kid who is... Uh, following a richer man, a wealthier man around because his allowance has been reduced by his mother and you can perceive the desperation of this young man who's used to uh, the higher things, to travel, to, 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 to traveling, to reveling. Uh, you can perceive his desperation, you can perceive that he he's about to commit something drastic, he's about to end his own life because he cannot really cope with having his opulent world reduced in any way. And the text gives you this poignant reflection that this young man is going to kill himself because he has to live on a monthly salary that's $170 more than what some of the poorer characters in the novel have to live on, uh, while at the same time also supporting their, own, the, their whole families. An even more crucial passage to highlight this big divide between these two different worlds comes in, in the second half of the novel, which is a prolonged action scene to have and have not. It's definitely action-packed, it's always Hemingway, so everything is described in very terse terms, uh, in, uh, with 
quite dry language conveying the action in a very fast, very detached manner. But that said, it is a novel full of heists and shootouts and people dying left and right. In this central part, in this uh, prolonged action scene, as I mentioned, you have, well, something happens that will be the doom of Harry, the doom of the protagonist, because it will take his boat away from him. What happens is that a, a pretty important politician in the US government of the time, while he's out fishing in the open sea, he sees Harry as he is dropping some liquor into the sea, some liquor that he'd been trying to smuggle. And this politician makes a point of ruining Harry's life and to make sure that Harry's boat is taken away from him and that he pays for what he has done. And I'm not trying to build a case saying that Harry is actually a good person. I don't think he is, and I am pretty positive that the text doesn't try to build him. Uh, well, maybe it builds him as a bit of a Hemingway hero, but not definitely not as a good person in any way. But I will say that you can definitely perceive in the politician's speech, in the way he reacts to this crime that he has witnessed, you can definitely perceive a lack of understanding uh, about what's, what he's witnessing. He doesn't understand the causes behind the criminality and behind the actions that happen within this community. He only assumes that these people act this way, Harry acts this way, because he's a criminal. And he doesn't question the deeper causes and the deeper injustices within his society that have caused the com this community to fall so low. That's a very common attitude, and it is the easiest thing for the lucky ones among us, myself included, when we're confronted with crime, to just assume that these people are maybe evil, that there's something wrong with it, uh, that there's something missing in them, without really questioning the deeper causes of their behavior. And to have and have not, for all of its flaws, which I'll be talking about, never allows the reader to fall into that mistake and, and to subscribe to those views. It's always very clear in showing these roots, in exposing this, these dynamics. In fact, the, the main reason why Harry even had to go into smuggling is because he was cheated by a rich tourist who refused to pay him in the very first pages of the novel. The two texts that I kept thinking about when I was reading To Heaven at North are the first one, first and foremost, would be uh, John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath. Easily Steinbeck's most, well, enraged novel, if you pardon the pun, uh, the one where he is most focused on the terrible, destructive and dehumanizing consequences of capitalism in the US, especially in times of crisis, and how it's engineered to keep people, to push people who are already miserable and struggling to to get food on their tables and to just cope with their lives. It's engineered to push them into even greater misery. But even that one, even Grapes of Wrath, uh, is always concerned with the possibility of social change. And you, you perceive that even more in many other of Steinbeck's novels. Even when the character's predicament goes from bad to worse, there's always a sense in Steinbeck that social cohesion, that unionizing, that uh, be bringing the workers together as a force can be uh, an instrument for great social change. And these were tremendous time for that in the US. In the 1930s, there was so much potential for upheaval, uh, for socialist ideals to spread throughout American society, which would just be wiped out. All of this would be wiped out after World War II by tensions with the Soviet Union and so on and so forth. You perceive that in Steinbeck a lot, you do not perceive it at all in To Have and Have Not. Um, if Steinbeck's novels try to show this hopeful side of this desperate struggle, Hemingway is concerned with the opposite in showing the intertwined, interlocked dynamics that caused people in positions of power to just prey on the weak. Even uh, revolutionary forces play a role in To Have and Have Not, but they are shown as just as thuggish as the criminals in, in this underworld, in, in this society. These supposed, well, these terrorists that are supposedly fighting for the common man end up murdering quite a lot of common people on the way. These are two very different attitudes, Steinbeck's attitude of hope and commitment and Hemingway's attitude of disillusionment. 
and they are they just represent the the poetics and and the worldviews of two very different writers. Famously, in the course of World War II, um, Steinbeck would end up writing propaganda texts for the U.S. He wrote um, a text called uh, Bombs Away, uh, which was a bit of a propagandistic, um, again, essay, long essay about bomber pilots that Hemingway famously said he would have rather cut off his arm than having to write. You can see how their different attitudes brought them to different places in life and even more relevant to us as readers uh, were captured so very differently in their books. And for all that I am very much a Steinbeck man myself, I do believe that you need to read both these types of texts, including desperate, uh, hopeless texts such as To Have and Have Not, to get a fuller understanding of the human condition and of the situation of people living in such desperate times. And the other text I was thinking about, I mentioned too, would be The Shadow of the Rinsmouth by H.P. Lovecraft, possibly Lovecraft's most political text, most political short story, and another picture of the terrible consequences that economic downfall and poverty has on a seaside community and pushes them to terrible measures that bring along hideous consequences. It's obviously written in a completely different style, being Lovecraft and being a horror short story, but the two texts resonate with one another much louder than you may think. Uh, and if you do uh, read To Have and Have Not, I definitely recommend reading Innsmouth alongside it. A word about that economy of words. There is this idea that Hemingway writes in this very terse style, that his books tend to be bare bone and you don't get any sort of description or uh, minutiae of, of what you're reading, of the characterization, the external at least, characterization of his characters and locales. It's all about the psyche, it's all about the workings of these characters' minds as they are confronted with terrible scenarios of war, poverty, uh, hunting big animals, these sorts of extreme situations. But I will say that for all that To Have and Have Not is a very short novel, for all that he does, um, it doesn't give you that much of that sort of traditional realist novel embellishment that you come to expect from the Dickens of the world. At the same time, Hemingway does spend quite a long time characterizing certain elements of the narrative that are very important to him. To put it in very simpler terms, for all that this is a very short novel that doesn't spend a long time giving you the details of the character's past or their physical uh, appearance, it does spend quite a long time telling you about their conversations. The conversation that Harry has with a few dying men in the course of the book are stretched to take up entire pages, entire chapters even, and that is part of Hemingway's style, part of this idea that these conversations, dialogue, is the way he he tries to convey the workings of human beings, of their psyche, uh, the workings of their relations with one another, without going too much into description, by trying to step aside from intervening as an author and just having his characters speak for themselves, literally, uh, very often through dialogue. Uh, indirect speech is another very common technique. Uh, I'm not even sure what you get in here is free in direct speech because it's all generally quite obvious um, that the thoughts you're reading come from one specific character and do not really fuse very modernistically with um, the narrator. If this is, if this is a modernist novel, I would say, but a low modernist for the modernist nerds out there. Um, through these things, through the workings of the characters' minds, through their interactions, you get an entire worldview and you're, you're able to reconstruct their entire social situation, the way they approach the world, their priorities in terms of, again, supporting their families, making a livelihood, um, refusing to, um, uh, to take a government work that will pay very little because it's beneath them and they would rather go out and smuggle liquor, that is, until they get shot and then they kind of regret doing that. Hemingway is truly able to show all of the contradictions even in the psyche of his characters just through these very bare, very simplistic tools, which are only obviously, only um, apparently simplistic and are actually incredibly complex to master. To Have and Have Not is a very hard book to read. The rich people in here are, are terrible and obnoxious. The poor people are 
desperate and, and violent and coping with tooth and nail with the, the terrible predicament they're in. It's a difficult novel, it's quite racist. Everybody knows that Hemingway was um, a, a violent man and a misogynist, but did you know he could also be quite racist? Uh, it's quite racist, it's um, a classic Hemingway novel where you get this mutilated hero who is at once deeply flowed, but also possibly because of that the text tries to construct him also as a sort of modern hero and almost um, legendary figure. Uh, all the women in this novel, the only thing they think about is men, uh, you know, uh, I hope you know, my husband will still like me a couple of years from now, am I, am I still pretty for him? It's, it's all they think about. It's Hemingway. The novel has the kind of horrible, uh, terrible flows that Hemingway's fiction clearly has. His fiction is problematic. I think at this time in history we can all agree on that. But I do believe that if you can cope with that, if you can look past it and you can turn it into part of your reading experience, something that makes you indignant and that you dislike, but that is constructive in its ugliness, then there is much to be appreciated potentially in this picture of the paradoxes of our society and of those social mechanisms that make it so that violence inevitably only generates more violence and misery drags people down with it and generates more misery. What did you think about To Have and Have Not? Do you count it among uh, Hemingway's great works, don't you? I must confess I haven't heard it discussed too much in the past. I'm not sure it's ranked among his great works, but I'm curious to discuss it with you guys because, as always, I might well be mistaken. Thank you so much to my patrons for sponsoring this and my other videos, to you for watching it, and to Skillshare for sponsoring the video too. As I mentioned, Skillshare is a website full of creatives and experts in a variety of fields, offering video classes in all of these skills or areas where uh, they are so knowledgeable. And what I like the most about the website is that it has a beautiful creative and community vibe to itself. Each of these video classes comes with a community space when you can discuss the skills you're learning with other people taking the class, other people who are as passionate as you about, say, illustration or creative writing or painting or whatnot. A class I really appreciated recently was called Happy Houseplants by Chris Such from The Sill. Uh, especially in the last year or so, having uh, started to pay more attention to my environments, because as many of you, I'm sure I spend most of my day at home, I've started caring about my houseplants more. And this class, in just a handful of videos with a few key tips and suggestions, enlightened me on many aspects of house gardening that had puzzled me so far. How, how often are you supposed to water your plants? How can I tell if I've overwatered it? How can I tell if it's dying of thirst? These and more you learn through Chris's amazing class. And there's so much more on Skillshare. I definitely recommend you check it out and take a look at the many classes on offer. Skillshare is also quite cheap. It's less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. And don't forget to click on that link in the description box that will give the first thousand people to click on it a free trial of Skillshare premium membership. Thank you as always for watching the video and bye everyone.